Urutia mai te tā uru o te rangi ki a tīna ki a oena ki a toko te manoa ora. Tīna toko te manoa ora ki ia, tīna toko te manoa ora ki rangi nui e tui o nei, ki a papa tuanuku e takotu nei. Ki tēnā, ki tēnā, tātou te o anau, ngā o naunga me ngā peringa karanga maa. Apati atu ki te unga mā wiwi, te unga e tāmi ana i te pauritanga. Koi a rā e rongo, whakaire ake ki ronga. Tūturu o ka whakamaua ki a tīna, tīna, haumi e, hui e, tāi ki e. E rauranga tira mā kua tai mai ki kua whakarau i ka mai i tēnei kaupapa, nau mai hara mai. Hara mai ki tēnei o ngā kaupapa nā tū tama wahine o taranaki e whāri ki ana mō koutou mō tātou. He kaupapa nui tēnei, he kaupapa whakahirahira, he whakatairangitia tātou i roto i ngā tirohanga whakamua mō a tātou ānau. He uri tēnei o Taranaki Maunga o Te Arawa anō hoki o Tainui me ngā mautere o Samoa e mihi nei ko Hine Rangi Edwards tōku ingoa ko au tō kai whakahaere i tēnei o ngā wahanga. Tino wai mārie tātou, kei ko nei, tete i o ngā tino, tino rangatira, tino mārei kura i tēnei o te ao rangahau, ara ko Leone Pihama. E hoa mā, it's wonderful to be together today on this very important kaupapa, a kaupapa around family violence for Māori, intersectionality and violence. And we've been, our speaker in this session is Leone Pihama. We're very, very fortunate um, to have the amazing wealth of knowledge, experience and um, insight from the research team of He Waka Eke Noa, uh, who bring together a body of research that is unseen at this point, um, that has not had, um, this, this body of work has not been researched in, in, a, in the way that is centred in kaupapa Māori approaches and um, we acknowledge the organisations that have supported uh, Tu Tama Wahine o Taranaki to present this research to you. Um, and those um, organisations include, um, and let's just make sure I get everybody here, um, we have Te Aratupu, Puranga Kura, Te pun Puna Oranga, Māori and Indigenous Analysis Limited, we have Te Whare Wānanga o Awanui Ārangi, Te Atawhai o Te Ao, Kākāriki Consulting, Te Whānau o Te Rau Aroha, Lalanga Training and Consultancy, with the financial support of the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. My name is Hine Rangi and I'm a Director of RT Solutions and it is an honour for us to be supporting Tutama Wahine to present this series of webinars for you today. Uh, this morning, uh, Ma, for those of you who joined us, um, we were uh, privileged to hear from Professor Linda Tuhiwai Smith, and she presented an introduction for this body of research called Hewaka Ekenoa. Uh, she acknowledged um, those who have contributed. Um, and also the passing of one of our tino maraikura. And Leone, I hope that when we work to, to, together in the session that you can also share with us insights um, from uh, our maraikura who has passed and who's made this big contribution to this mahi. Um, our session today, uh, Defining Family Violence for Māori, Intersectionality and, and Violence, uh, we hope will provide insights not only to practitioners who are on this call today, but also researchers and Fano members. Uh, we uh, look forward to looking at uh, solutions, the issues, but also uh, looking at strategies that we can employ uh, in addressing um, these issues today. Um, <clears throat> so, Ite Fano, I am just going to make sure. Ah, oh, tikanga. So, um, ehua 
no one can see you in this session. It is, we're using a webinar function. So um, uh, the only people that we'll see on screen is Leonie Pihama and um, myself, particularly in the Q&A part of the session. Uh, we do have a, a question and answer function that is um, at the bottom of your of your um, toolbar, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A. You can click onto there and you can ask your question either anonymously or if you unclick that, um, that tick, uh, we will we'll know um, that it was you. Um, the questions don't pop up until they have been answered um, in, in that function. So, um, and you'll be able to see the questions there that um, have been acknowledged. Uh, we will have a, a one hour session with um, Professor Leonie Pihama and then a 30 minute question and answer session. So we look forward to um, the flow of those um, coming through. Uh, we also um, realise and acknowledge that this kaupapa may be very personal for many of you who may be watching, and so we would like to ensure that um, that you have the support that you may need um, in thinking about um, the issues that may um, surface for you in this session. So um, we'd like to acknowledge um, Modi Oho, and you can click on to um, www m-a-u-r-i-o-h-o modioho.org.nz um, which uh, Modi Oho provide um, kaupapa Māori services and um, resources to support you to explore this kaupapa. Also the um, Family Violence Information Line on 0800 456 450 that's 0800 456 450 and also the website <coughs> Are You OK? So it's www.areyouok.org.nz. We have practitioners who are also online today. So um, you, um, in your writing of the Q&A, if there are services that you want to make us aware of, please um, do pop it in there. And, um, and as we address your comment, um, they'll also be shared with the wider whānau. Uh, for those of you who uh, uh, may have hearing impairment, uh, there is in the chat, you'll see a, um, a message there about instructions on how to create closed captions for yourself um, on your side of the screen. So you can hear our speaker, but you can also read um, the words coming through. Uh, e whanau, uh, one other thing is, if you need to um, uh, go for a walk or or take a moment out from this from the kaupapa, this um, session will be recorded, and the um, Tutama Wahine or Taranaki and the lead researcher on this kaupapa, Leone Pihama, um, uh, look forward to being able to share this in in future recordings, um, so you can access it as a resource tool later on and we'll have some um some comments about that at the end of our session i'm sure uh etifano without further ado ado i would like to um introduce our speaker for this for this session um not that she needs introduction either um <clears throat> but he whanaunga tēnei ki au taku wai māori anō hoki uh he mārei kura nō roto i a te atiawa Ngā mahanga a taere, Ngāti mahanga. Leone is a mother of six and a grandmother of five. She's a director of Māori and Indigenous Analysis Limited and a kaupapa Māori, a kaupapa Māori research company. Leone is a leading kaupapa Māori educator and researcher and is co-principal investigator with Professor Linda Smith on he waka e ke noa. Uh, e te māre kura, tēnei um, mātou e mihi ana ki I aikea Linda Smith, ko koe te wahine, e whakakaha aki aki ki te rōpū nei, kia, um, ko ke whakamua, kia haere pai tēnei waka um, uh, mō tātou. So, um, Fire Linda was saying that um, that you have the ability to wrangle and hustle and get people um, to, to, to mahi tahi, and that is no small feat. Uh, so tēnei te mihi ki a koe 
um, flyer. Ka Kawai ho te waki a koe. I've noted to we have over 70 participants online with us um, currently and um, and we will receive those questions um, as we go along, but we'll come back together at the end of your of your corridor um, so that we can address some of those and others that come through. Kawai ho te waki a koe, tēnā mō koe. Uh, e aku iti e aku dahi, uh, e aku taranga maha. Uh, nei rātu mihi atu ki aku tui hui hui mai nei rongi tēnei, ipurangi tēnei wā. Uh, <coughs> ko wai tēnei, uh, ko taranaki maunga, ko taranaki wenua, uh, ko taranaki iwi, te ati awa iwi, ko taranaki tangata tēnei e tū nei. E mei kau atu tēnei ki a koe, uh, e te whanaunga nau e whaka... Uh, tūwhera i tō tātou hui nei, uh, i rongi i te karakia. Um, kia whaka pai, kia whaka ora te haere o tēnei o nga mahi, no reira uh, hi ni rangi tēnei te mahi, mihi atu ki a koe, e te whanaunga. Uh, kia koutou i hui hui mai nei i tēnei wā, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, katoa. Um, Aupu. <coughs> uh, yeah, welcome everyone. I, I just wanted to um, say very first off, um, I'm doing this webinar out of my son's study and um, the lawnmower people have just arrived. So mm -hmm. I wanted to put that out there now in case you hear a little bit of noise in the, in the background coming through. Um, we know what it's like on these kinds of uh, sessions that all kinds of things can be happening in the background that we didn't expect to be happening. Um, <clears throat> but yes, welcome back to uh, Te Waka Eke Noa. I want to acknowledge um, firstly our Rōpū uh, Rangahau, uh, the team uh, from the project who have worked uh, in the over the past four years and particularly through a really difficult time of COVID um, to to get to the stage that we're at right now. And so I really want to acknowledge all of our, our team, um, Professor Linda Tuhiwai Smith, um, Linda, for opening this series in the earlier session. For those of you who are on this morning at nine o'clock, Linda gave an overview of the project, why we did the project, the kind of underpinning assumptions and the methodology of the project. And so um, my, my role is now to kind of follow on a little bit from that on behalf of the team. And I want to acknowledge uh, Tutamawahi no Taranaki and Tupuna Oranga or uh, Kio Tautahi, uh, the two um, key providers, Tutamawahi as the host provider for this mahi, uh, and to Tupuna Oranga, who have worked alongside um, us, and it's been our privilege and honour as researchers to work with both of these organisations for quite a long uh, period of time. So my role today is to bring some of the definitional work uh, to the table. Um, and, and I want to do that initially by carrying on from Linda's uh, mihi and acknowledgement of Hini Wirangi. Uh, Hini Wirangi Kohu Morgan, many of you um, know very well uh, in this field, have worked with Hini Wirangi. I had the privilege to meet um, Hini Wirangi when I was first um, a part of an organisation that was supporting the establishment of Te Kākano Te Whānau in 1985. And so I have a long uh, relationship, friendship, whanaungatanga uh, with Hini Wirangi and very thankful and grateful for her input into all of us uh, for many, many years and acknowledge her and her passing and acknowledge her whānau uh, for all of what they have done to uphold the work that she did uh, in her life and uh, continue to do so um, now in her memory. So ete māre kura moi mai rā. I'm just trying to move the screen along. Okay. So I'm just wanting to uh, revisit uh, from Linda uh, this morning the, the mahi or the kaupapa of Hiwaka Ekenoa. 
and that was to undertake a research project that was mixed methods, as we had a number of different methods that we used uh, within the project to identify the prevalence of family and sexual violence for Māori and to explore cultural approaches to family violence from Māori perspectives uh, in order to document those and to frame those in ways that come from our understanding, from a kaupapa Māori understanding in terms of intervention and prevention of family violence and sexual violence, of all violence experienced by Māori. And Linda taught uh, briefly this morning around uh, the impact of colonisation, the impact of state violence and the ongoing impact uh, of institutional violence. And um, Cheryl Smith will be following in the next session at two o'clock, giving some more in-depth discussion uh, of that. So I guess one of the questions that we talked about as a Zopu, uh, as we were developing the work and doing what Linda called the Kaupapa Māori co-production or that whanaungatanga work of developing the project, one of the things that came up was around influencing dominant policy processes uh, when they're grounded upon flawed assumptions about our people. And Linda talked a little bit about those deficit uh, belief systems that have often underpinned the approaches, um, not only in this field, in many, many fields, education, health, justice, and the ideologies or stereotypes and the deficit dominant beliefs that tend to underpin that. So one of the things we wanted to look at was how do our people talk about violence? How do our people talk about family violence? How do we define family violence? How do we define um, the acts of violence that are not only experienced within and amongst our whānau, but upon our whānau, hapu and iwi, and our people? And so this particular webinar is looking at some of those definitions uh, that were shared uh, by a whole range of people uh, and whānau uh, across uh, the four-year period. There is some overarching context, and uh, I know that in the Q&As in the last session with Linda, there are a lot of questions that were asking about the findings, really. What are the findings of the research? And, and I know that over the next um, three weeks, there's going to be a lot of findings that are going to be shared through the webinar series. What we wanted to do is be very systematic in how we lay out uh, the conversations uh, that we're having in terms of this webinar series. And so establishing the context, as Linda did, the research context, and now my role is to kind of establish the, the, the kind of sectorial context a little bit from a research perspective, um, is to give a grounding upon which to then understand, position, and locate the findings. There is a tendency for people, particularly for government agencies, people in policy, to try and find a quick fix by finding the answers in the findings. But actually, in Kaupapa Māori research that we do, um, the answers for us are in the entirety of the work the entirety of the process, the entirety of the relationships, and they appear in the findings. But in order to understand the survey findings, in order to understand the findings from the whakawhiti kōrero, or the conversations and interviews, we, we need to be able to locate that in a context. It's, it's, it's a part of what Graham Smith talks about in terms of positionality within Kaupapa Māori. How do we position ourselves? What is our context? Are we the right people to be engaged in this work? What do we know about the background of the work? So even looking at definitions that our people shared in the Rangahau, it's important to understand that these definitions have come forward in a context. And so there are some overarching contexts that we need to think about. One is that in the sector, they still tends to be a focus in dominant discourse, primarily around intimate partner violence, the violence that occurs between relations, between intimate partners, uh, and, and a kind of domestic uh, context and a one-to-one -one context. That is the dominant discourse primarily. That the notion of uh, domestic and things like the DBA Act um, 
have been said to not only by Māori but also by a number of uh, Pākehā and Pacifica uh, researchers and scholars that the, the notion of domestic has its limitations in terms of thinking about the wider context of family violence uh, and that we need to move beyond this kind of individual approach. That is not to dis dismiss that that one-to-one -one, uh, experience happens, but it's to say that it is that plus more. The context of family as it's defined and continues to be defined uh, in dominant discourse in a nuclear domestic space is very problematic when we're talking about that in relation to understanding the dynamic dynamics of violence for Māori. The nuclear family model, as we uh, have discussed in other work, uh, was a colonial imposition that actually has been a way of actually providing a creating a context where uh, that one-to-one -one or intimate violence is more able to occur because of the structures of how a nuclearized, domesticized, genderized family is presented. Uh, that is Māori were being framed in dominant deficit discourse as the problem. This is something that Māori across the board have been saying for a very, very long time. Um, that this continued to finding us as the problem. Uh, and that things are driven by that. And actually we're seeing this uh, very, very much uh, re-emerge with a lot of um, uh, push from the upcoming uh, potential coalition partners that we're seeing. Uh, that dominant mainstream, white stream definitions remain inadequate. This has been something that's been argued for some time and they failed to take into account the impacts of historical and colonial trauma. As I said, Cheryl, uh, we'll share a little bit more about that in the following session. There's a failure to acknowledge and recognise the ways in which the state and its agencies enact and reproduce violence upon whānau and contribute to the wider social context within which whānau find ourselves. This is something that was raised in the Q&A uh, also uh, in the last session, and it's been a part of the overall context of what uh, Māori working in the field uh, of violence prevention and intervention have continued to face. We've continued to face ongoing um, minimalization or defending of the Crown and its agencies of their role or denial of their role in terms of violence perpetrated upon Māori. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, we're in a context where we continue to have a kind of ongoing marginalization of Mātauranga Māori and Tikanga Māori as legitimate as valid um, and as really critical approaches to well-being. I think in the next three years, we're going to have to really uh, be working in spaces where this is going to be even more prevalent. Um, <clears throat> there's little or no uh, acknowledgement of our role as Māori as a solution. And in the historical trauma um, research done with Jatapanti Al and with Cheryl and Rawiri and the team there, what was really clear throughout that work is our articulation of we are the solution, we have the solutions, we are not supported to enact those solutions. Um, and so that brings us to the kind of ongoing failure of the Crown and successive governments to provide adequate or equitable or treaty grounded, tenity grounded support uh, for Kopapa Māori initiatives. So that's a kind of wider structural, a touch on the kind of wider structural context that, that the research has been located in and much of the work that you're all doing um, <clears throat> has been positioned in. And it's something that, well, you know, for us we have to be very cognizant of as we were moving through uh, the mahi itself. So... <clears throat> One thing that we asked very clearly in the Whakawhiti Kōdeo, which was the kind of conversational part, the hui, the interview component of the work, was how do we define violence? As Māori, <clears throat> what do we consider to be integral and critical in defining violence and defining family violence and defining sexual violence uh, within a kaipapa Māori framework? And so <clears throat> one of the critical things, and I know in the title I've got 
a comment around intersectionality, and I'll come back to that in, in a little in a little while. But really, we are talking about violence as being multi-layered. It's been experienced through all parts of society, of being intergenerational, of being both structural and systemic, being both lateral and horizontal, being both imposed and internalized, and being experienced both individually and collectively. That is experienced in multiple ways, in cultural ways, in structural ways, <clears throat> in symbolic ways. So people talked a lot about the ways in which they see representations of ourselves, the way in which symbols around being Māori are portrayed, and the violence of those forms of stereotypes or enactments of how people see us and present us. Violence is intellectual and epistemic, and this is something we've really not had a lot of conversation about uh, in, in the field, and that is the violence of knowledge, the way in which we've seen uh, these arguments that Mātūranga Māori is not valid knowledge. Now, we've been dealing with these for over 180 years. It's not new, but it was not. it's not being really considered in the same way as a form of violence against our people. Uh, what we've tended to have is the physical, an acknowledgement of the physical, spiritual, psychological, emotional, mental, sexual violence, an acknowledgement of that, but very little acknowledgement of the cultural, structural, symbolic, intellectual, or epistemic knowledge violence. So when we're looking at those things, we're thinking about violence in a very multi-layered, interactive way. The other part of the way that people talked about our own definitions was that tikanga based definitions of violence are all encompassing of all forms of relationships. And that the relationality of whakapapa that Linda talked about this morning, the importance of our place in whakapapa. And I do want to say, and I've said this a number of times before, that our whakapapa exist irrespective of our knowledge of the names of our tupuna. We really need to remember this, that as Māori, we all have whakapapa. Some of us know who all of those generations are, and some of us don't. And there are reasons for that, around a disconnection to knowledge and a disconnection to relationships over periods of time, over 180 years. So, <clears throat> but that it came through all of the conversations that were had, that if we're talking about uh, tikanga ways of thinking about violence prevention and intervention, we have to think about it as ourselves always in relationship. And so any form of violence, any form of violence is an absolute assault on the entirety of the individual, their whānau, and their whakapapa. So for many people working in this field, this is not new. This is an affirmation of that knowledge. That tikanga-based definitions move beyond the act of the violence itself to the wider impacts on all parts of our life. So as we would expect when we're talking to our own people around Kaupapa Māori definitions of violence, Mātauranga Māori, Tikanga Māori, thinking around violence. Uh, violence has been uh, referred to as a transgression and as a violation of tapu. And so trying to relearn this in our own lives as a part of our own revitalization, regeneration of knowledge journey uh, that we have to do for ourselves. No one can do this for us. We have to do this for ourselves, this understanding, the shift in ourselves of this understanding. And um, in all of the conversations where people talked around this, when we talked about remembering that we are tapu, 
remembering that we are sacred, remembering that all of us are sacred and that any violence, uh, there is a transgression and a violation. There's a transgression and a violation of all that is held sacred. So there is a decolonizing process we also need to do in order to bring ourselves back to this understanding. That tikanga is central to our understanding. As we know, there are many kōrero, there are many writings, there are many pūrāko, there are many whakatauki that talk to us about doing what is tika. Doing what is tika, attempting to correct behaviours, and to work on that, really to be better, better versions of ourselves, both individually and collectively. People talked about the violations, the way in which that transgression is also a transgression of mana and therefore a transgression of whakapapa. So if we look at definitions uh, that are provided to us and shared with us by uh, rangatira like uh, Rangi Māori Rose Piri, like Wirangi Waikiripuru, uh, like Māori Marsden and uh, Miriana Pittman, many others, many others, that mana and the, uh, that we, the mana that we carry is also the mana of our tupuna. It is also the mana of our mokupuna. So those forms of violations of mana is, uh, occur throughout our whakapapa line, our past, present, and our future. So that understanding was talked about by many whānau in the research and many Māori working and kaupapa Māori practitioners and practice. That tikanga-based definitions of, of violence, therefore, again, reiterating, is that assault. So what we have to do is to work in a collective manner to shift some of these understandings that colonisation has embedded within our, ourselves, within our communities, within the ways in which we have to work within society, and to shift those in a way where we can come back to an understanding of mana, of tapu, of whakapapa. But not only of a human of a human context. I think one of the things that have really been highlighted in this mahi and in Heoranga Ngako is our people really reminding ourselves that we've become very tangata centric. We've become very people centric. That actually is a direct consequence of colonialism, where human beings are considered to be more important and considered to be indominant. And you can see that in the in the racial hierarchies, in the community hierarchies that Western ideologies have uh, exported here and have utilised as dominant ways of thinking of relationships in the world. But within Tao Māori, that we're in relationship to all that we live with and all that we live beside. We're in relationship with our whenua, we're in relationship with our taiao, we're in relationship with all living beings uh, that we live with, our moana, our atua. And so any violence or abuse of our whenua, of our taia, of our moana, is a violence upon our relations and therefore a violence upon our people. So the definitions have to move beyond a human-centric definition to a definition of all relationships. So for us, any violation, any violence that occurs to our maunga is a violence to our tupuna and therefore is a violence to us. So we can see that the way in which our people think about tikanga, tikanga-based definitions is a very expansive one and it really pushes out the boundaries of definitions of what constitutes family violence and sexual violence and what constitutes violence more generally. So, but that doesn't mean that uh, we didn't talk about and Fano didn't talk about you know, the things that happen internally uh, within and amongst us and the impact of power. And Linda talked a little bit about power uh, this morning and the way in which power becomes either kind of negative or positive or controlling or, or not uh, in the context of relationships and the way in which people enact their power. Uh, so in terms of power and control, a number of Fano and a number of practitioners, Māori, talked about power and control. 
talked about that of bringing violence into multiple levels and, and that there is a context of intentional harm of others that we also need to be cognizant of and thinking about all of the time. Now, that kind of power and control we're talking about is not only individuals, it's also embedded in state systems, it's embedded in ministries, it's embedded in agencies, it's embedded in structures, it's embedded in systems. So the notions of power and control are not only about individuals. Again, it's coming back to thinking about collective systems and the ways of operating. That when we think about these things, that um, all acts of violence and abuse are the antithesis to tikanga. That is that they operate in direct contradiction to, particularly in terms of how we talk about tikanga components of manaakitanga, of aroha, of afi, of uh, totoko, those kind of tikanga comp uh, components that violence runs contrary and is really the direct opposite of those tikanga. So how do we bring those back in terms of understanding the ways in which violence interrupts those tikanga? and how those chikanga can then be utilised to heal and to shift the dynamics. So when we're talking about uh, chikanga, we're talking about utilising chikanga, and this is going to come up later uh, in this, the webinars around how people talked about utilising chikanga, because I think the practice of it, often it's, it's uh, easier to talk about than it is actually to do. Now, many of us in our lives will know that, that we can conceptualize, we can theorize, we can speak to certain tikanga. And then the enactment of it takes a, a conscious, deliberate, intentional practice to do that. Because we are living in a context that actually tells us that we might benefit more from not doing it. That's what colonialism tells us. Colonialism tells us we should only be thinking about the individual. Colonialism and capitalism tells us that we should be doing anything to get forward in our own individual selves or in our own nuclear family. There's a lot that mitigates against the practice of tikanga within the systems that we live in and the context that we live in. Our people, as Linda touched on this morning, talked a lot about violence in terms of state violence that was also raised in the Q&A a number of times, that state violence, we have to have an analysis of state violence. We have to have an analysis intergenerationally, historically, and today. We need to understand and we need to remember that colonization is not a singular act of invasion, that colonization is a series of systems and structures that are embedded upon indigenous peoples on our lands that remain today and that continue to reproduce themselves every day and impact and perpetrate on our people every day. So colonization is a series of events, it is a series of um, invasions or events, and it's also structures and systems that we live with every day. And that's going to come up in the state violence discussions with Cheryl, but also later on in the survey with us, Shirley. That the development of the state was built on multiple forms of violence, patriarchal, ableist, racist, colonial, neoliberal, economic. That it's grounded in disposition of our people, of the denial of our land, of our deal, of our tikanga, all of those things that are connected. So when we're talking about institutionalized structures and systems, and we're talking about this idea of intersectionality, intersectionality is fundamentally the way in which multiple experiences of discrimination or oppression come together and intersect. Okay. So when we're talking about racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, ableism, all of these things, how they intersect with each other is what intersectionality is about. How do all of those things come together in a way that create a deeper level of oppression or discrimination of certain groups of people? So this is not only something that we're talking about as Māori, of course it's not, it's something that Indigenous peoples have had a deep understanding of 
for for hundreds of years. It's something that we know uh, that colonization interacts with these things, that it operates in a way to ensure that these kind of oppressions, that these ways of being are maintained. Colonization requires a structure of hierarchy to be maintained. It requires racism, it requires sexism, it requires all of these things, homophobia, it requires transphobia. It requires for its existence to be reproduced for these systems of structural oppression to be maintained and to be reproduced. And so we see in some of the current transphobia coming out of organizations, political organizations, that that is about them conserving the existing status quo. The word conservative is about conserving the existing system. So these intersectionalities of oppression have to be reproduced for those who sit at the top of the power and control hierarchy to maintain their position, to legitimate their position, to reproduce their position. So that's why thinking about intersectionality is really important for us as Māori and for Indigenous people. So in that, what are the roles of state agencies? These are questions that we asked throughout the discussion. You know, what are the roles of the state? What are your experiences with the state? Have you experienced state violence? Have you experienced institutional violence? Alongside understandings of have you experienced community violence? Have you experienced family violence? That they are all a part of something that we need to know to get a bigger picture in order to make the kind of transformative changes that we need to make. Research done by people like Denise Wilson, uh, you know, show us very clearly that the state agencies often then re-perpetuate violence upon women and children in particular that are coming forward for support from violence. We know in the work that came up and the questions that came up from Paula this morning that organisations have continued to uh, perpetrate violence upon our tamariki and mokopuna and what they call state care. So these state agencies, not only have we been calling them out in the past 10 years, but we really need to start evidencing the level of, of which this is impacting on our whānau. And this cumulative violence, the way in which it occurs both personally and structurally. So this is really following on from some of the work by Graham Smith around a kaupapa Māori approach to whatever sector we are looking at. We must be able to provide us with some um, ways of considering, analysing and speaking back to what is happening individually and collectively in relationship with each other, but also what's happening in terms of structural and cultural or personal and structural levels. That to only look at one of those levels is insufficient to get a good understanding of what is happening for Māori. I just want to move now to, in this last kind of 10 minutes, I want to move to some of the direct quotes that came through the Whakawhiti Kōrero. Um, Linda talked about the methods this morning, and and she talked about that we we had wānanga, thought space for wānanga, we had hui and to, around the uh, number of regions, uh, and we had uh, Whakawhiti Kōrero interviews. And so... What we are wanting to do is to kind of get both the collective and individual voice through those processes. And so the, these quotes come from a number of those contexts that we're in. But I do want to open with this one, which is um, from the task force. And, and those of you working in the area are very familiar uh, with this report. And it's around their understandings in terms of whānau violence. Whānau violence is a compromise of te ao Māori values, as an absence or a disturbance in tikanga, right? and a transgression of whakapapa. So all of this is in the context of understanding colonisation, and the task force was very clear in its articulation 
of the need for us to understand that family violence, our, our current experience of family violence was not the experience of our tupuna. That colonization has created a whole range of contexts and sites where it is more likely to occur, as well as being a perpetrator of violence itself. So in terms of thinking around intersectionality, and as a, a, yeah, people who know the work that we do within a kaupapa Māori frame, we are constantly thinking about these kind of intersections and the way in which they come about. But it's come through a whole range of work. It's not just through the work that, that uh, we've been doing with He Waka Eke Noa or previously with He Oranga Ngāke. It's come through a, a range of work, and, and Denise has talked about this in her work, around you know, the interconnections of homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, classism, ableism, racism, all of these things in the way in which they intersect. And the way in which they intersect uh, for our people and the multiple layers that they intersect within. And particularly in terms of those impacts of colonial violence, in terms of thinking around what is happening to our people. One of the kai kōrero, and this is one of many quotes from kai kōrero within the uh, research itself, that colonial ideologies and practices of gender and race have been imported and impacted significantly. Then uh, Alison Green, uh, and this comes from a project we did, the Honor Project, looking at the impact of uh, discrimination for tokatāpui and LGBTQI plus communities. Again, that intersection of sexuality, of gender, of cultural identity, and the way in which discrimination is experienced. Now, in that research, um, over 75% of Takatapui in that research talked about experiencing levels of distress, high levels of distress from discrimination. And then people talking more broadly about their definitions around family violence and around violence for Māori. And again, so we're going to send these out, these um, PowerPoints. And I, it's a lot of words. I know Linda did say in the session this morning, beware of a lot of words. Uh, and they are a lot. But part of what we do in our, in our mahi is really trying to give as much of the content from uh, those who have been engaged with us in the mahi as possible. And, and why would we want to write this ourselves when it's been so said so articulately by our people? So these uh, two particular quotes, again, are about how our people see that if tikanga is about doing what is correct, then violence is about ahi. So what do we need to do? It's about an abuse. How do we need to understand this? It's at a level of ngāko, hiningaro, tinana, wairua, all of those things. And they'll be talked about later on in the series of webinars as well. About thinking about violations. What's um, particularly pertinent uh, in the second quote here, if you just want to skip to the last couple of lines, is that this person goes to talk about we need to be able to identify the areas of violation as opposed to the acts of violence. So there are acts of violence. What does that mean in terms of what is the violation? How is the violation? being considered, felt, experienced. And, and that is something that um, in previous mahi we hadn't heard people talk about so succinctly. And so I think that's something for us all to consider. Ideas of imbalance, of being out of control, ideas of control and power, Ideas of transgression, um, of that whakapapa, whanaingatanga, connect, of 
the relationship of concepts of mana, of modi, of tapu, of wairua, of whakapapa, all of those things, all of those ways in which kaupapa Māori practitioners are working to reveal and to share and to support healing in for many of our whānau. But also, those things are occurring when we have an experience with state agencies. So we also need to look at how do we actually engage in those relationships with the state? How do we seek about explaining those? Because all of these definitions of what people are talking about, what constitutes family violence, is applicable to structural violence, to institutional violence, to state violence. <clears throat> A number of areas of conversation that people had was actually around, and it comes back to the title, He Waka Ekenoa. The title that Linda talked about this morning. He waka eke noa. And we're really aware that a number of organizations use this. We're aware that a number of state agencies use this. They really should stop using it uh, because they're not on a waka. They're not on our waka. They're not on this waka. And the, it's not really the state doing anything significant to change what it is that we're wanting to change at the moment. So the title He waka eke noa is utilized in this particular mahi really was about that collective well-being moving forward. So in this first quote, and there are a number of uh, people who shared their own stories, their own pūdāko, around coming up against uh, an event or an act of violence outside of themselves and the kind of things that they felt needed to happen, that it needed to be a collective movement to make a change. So this person is like, you know, what can I do to intervene? What is my obligation? What is my obligation to stop something in relation to another person, another Māori person? What is our role collectively to bring an end to this? And this is not advocating pulling yourself in harm's way. And no one is advocating that. It is about how do we collectively move forward to make changes? How do we collectively reinstate the whanaungatanga relationships that our tūpuna had in place as a preventative uh, to violence, both family violence and colonial violence and historical violence? We dealt with colonial violence as a people collectively. We dealt with it in a way that our hapu and iwi would be well. So the many ways that people talk and define family violence and its relationship to what is happening uh, comes throughout the entirety of the report and in many ways affirms what organisations like the Kākano Te Whānau, like Ngā Kaitiaki Modi and many others have been advocating for over 40 years. And so it is a reaffirmation of a context of understanding family violence through a kaupapa Māori lens. So thinking about things like dehumanising, thinking about things like oppression, thinking about things like colonial uh, violence, thinking about things like the impact of institutional violence, all of those things have been central to the way in which our whānau discuss and engage with ideas and definitions of violence. And that is one of the really key components of the Waka Eke Noa, was to rethink these, was to reaffirm this, was to restate that the definitions of violence, the definitions of family violence and sexual violence that many Māori have had to work with, live with and engage with um, for many years have really failed to take into account the complexities and the multi-layered nature of violence that we experience. And therefore, if the fundamental definitions are flawed, 
or inadequate or unable to explain our experience of violence, then the outcome of that is that the ways in which it's dealt with, the so-called solutions, are also going to be inadequate and unable to deal with how we experience violence. Because one of the things that we uh, have known for many years as kaupapa Māori practitioners, researchers, community workers, is that if you ask the wrong question, if you frame the problem, as Linda has, has told us, in a way that is inappropriate or inadequate or does not take into account the context or the understandings of the people that you're framing the problem for, i.e. Indigenous people, Māori people, then your solutions are going to be flawed. They are not going to be able to provide what we need to move forward. You frame the, if you if you ask the wrong question, you will always inevitably get the wrong answer. But what we wanted to do in Hewaka Ekinoa was to work with Māori practitioners, Kaupapa Māori practitioners and organizations and Fano to frame the question, to frame the context, to frame the experiences in a way that actually aligns to the kind of definitions that we believe need to be engaged in order to be able to move forward with the with the solutions, with the understandings that we know actually can work, have work, worked, and do work for our people. A te nānu koe te, e te tuakana uh, me o kōrero hōhonu, o kōrero uh, whakamārama uh, i ēnei kōpapa whakahirihira. Uh, we have pātai, um, Leone, but also just recapping on some of the key messages. There are multiple messages that you've shared with us today. But... Um, uh, that the prevalence of the discourse, the that mostly when we're talking about violence, um, the uh, the conversation swirls around the intimate partner violence, and not about the system, the system wide colonization um, issues. And um, I just acknowledge the work that you and the research team have um, done over many years uh, to make those those connecting points, and that. As you said today, uh, colonization isn't a one um, one event, that it's a, se a series of events, systems and structures embedded um, in the everyday um, issues that we face. Uh, we had a comment, a part-time, well, first a comment and then a part-time mm -hmm. from, from Laurie and her um, comment was, I was taught in the women's movement in the 1960s and 70s a definition of oppression that says the systematic mistreatment of one group of people by another or a society as a whole that is reinforced and perpetuated by social institutions, um, for example, government, education, religion, and family. And her partai is, do you think that understanding has been siloed so that we don't realise social conditioning is systematic discrimination? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I think that um, many working in this field and across many sectors would consider that. I think that's a really great uh, definition um, that Laurie's brought around oppression, because we, you know, clearly we need to kind of understand all of these terms, this terminology that we're using. And so um, I think that what we've had is we've had this continual denial, even of colonization as an act, let alone colonization as a series of systems. Uh, and so similarly with oppression, which is why, you, you know, probably in the last 20 years, more prevalently, um, you know, there's been a lot more articulation of the kind of poor white man syndrome at the moment, uh, which we're getting through a lot of political parties because of the marginalization of any understanding of oppressive structures, of hierarchies, of systems, and the way in which uh, they operate and continue to reproduce uh, what is happening to the benefit of those who are in power 
and those who are in control. So I think um, I totally agree. I think that it's a really excellent point uh, that mm -hmm. Laura's raised. Yeah. You mentioned that um, to be conservative is conserving the existing systems. Mm -hmm. I found that really quite a um, uh, aha moment and also a duh, of course it is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, conservatism uh, in our current environment we're seeing the relanguaging of um, kaupapa to, as part of preserving um, the gains that we believe that we have been making over the last um, uh, generations. We, uh, Linda talked about the kohanga generation coming mm. through into, mm. into government as well. Um, mm. What do you think we need to do uh, to not get sucked in um, to uh, weakening our message, but reshaping our message to still stay as potent and as um, clear in our in our approach. What 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 would you recommend to practitioners in this space, but also yeah. those of us are preserving uh, an yeah. environment that we want for our mokopuna? Oh, no, I mean, definitely, I think that's a really important question for us to be thinking about at the moment, given the political context that we're in. Um, what I'd say is that we don't reshape, that we continue on the track that our tūpuna have put us on, that we have been on for 180 odd years, and that is that we continue to assert our rangatiratanga, we consider, continue to assert our mana motuakitanga, we continue to ground ourselves on the tikanga and mātiranga and kaupapa Māori pathways that we have sought for ourselves, that we have aligned for ourselves, uh, both in, in terms of the sector, this, the sector of family violence and sexual violence prevention and intervention. You know, I remember the days of um, the beginnings, as I said that my um, mihi tuhini wirangi, you know, of 1985, and all of those, all of those wahine, uh, particularly, that stood up in terms of te kākano te whānau, and stood against what was happening in that context and laid a platform grounded on tupuna and maturanga knowledge for moving forward in this sector. And organisations like Ngā Kaitiaki Modi, who have been very privileged, and I can see Tina's on here, uh, you know, to have worked with as a researcher in the past uh, with the work that they have done. And, and you know, Billy Jean, who's in our team, is also a part of that organisation that those collective organisations have been pushing through a message in this area for a very long time. And, and if um, nothing else, we stand true to that message. We stand true to the, the path that we have set for ourselves. One of the things that um, I was asked the other day about the things like the referendum on the treaty, you know what, we just don't participate in that. that that's my view. We do not participate in anything that's about pushing us back 50 years. A hundred years that denies our treaty rights. So um, we we stay true to our path. What that means, I think, is that uh, we've had a semi level of comfortability in the past kind of six years, probably, uh, in dealing with a centre left government. It's not really a left wing government, but we've had people like the Greens uh, and the work that Manama has done in the sector to try and push forward. Uh, the desires of our people, um, and I and and that's going to come to an end. And so I think that we need to be very clear in our stand and keep true to our stand. I, I would, I would not see that we need to reframe because I don't think that we have reframed. I think we're stuck to our our intention. We've been deliberate in our goals. The Kohanga generation, yes. They're in Parliament. But you know what? We know the abuse that they're going to experience in Parliament. We know the collective and systemic abuse that those young people, as all Māori in Parliament, have experienced. And so uh, we also need to do something to ensure their well-being collectively mm -hmm. as they move forward. Um, conservatism, as, as, I, as I just said, and I think that we do forget this, when we're looking at a right-wing conservative government, we are looking at a government that is going to seek to entrench ways of ensuring that they conserve the existing hierarchy 
or any part of the hierarchy that they see has fallen away in the past six years, they are going to re-embed and they're going to put back in place and they're going to systemically make that happen. And so we need to be really cognizant uh, of that move and, and support each other. Tinaku, tinaku leoni. Uh, a uh, part I hear from um, Sienna Hamilton Kartini, Kia ora leoni. Thank you for affirming and confirming the kōrero that has um, been out in the community and presenting the stories of our whānau. In developing culturally appropriate definitions of violence from a kaupapa Māori perspective, have you also been looking at the ways in which kupu Māori have been developed to grow alongside these understandings? Mm. Um, we have, um, as we move through the mahi, uh, we'll start going into some of those areas of Adele, of tikanga, uh, of conceptual understandings that come with those that our people have discussed. And so um, in the Heoranga Ngāko work, you, you know, when we're thinking about historical, and Cheryl will talk more about this, when we're thinking about historical and colonial trauma and that way of thinking about uh, its impact. And so we had a number of... Uh, kupu that were shared, you know, pā mamai, uh, patu ngākau, those kupu. Yeah, so they're all there. And I think that within our um, type of Māori approaches, it's, we're, we are growing those. Um, they're not new kupu, in my view. They're, they're old kupu uh, that we're reutilising again to get a deeper understanding. I mean, I remember a number of years ago, someone talking to me about... Um, you know, well-being, hold mental, what they call mental health, and who try who saying to me, well, look at the kupu, haurangi, wairangi, pōrangi. And I was quite, I had an oe moment, I was thinking, in terms of that, because those words have often been um, translated in ways that are not appropriate. Mm. So uh, in a kavanga from Tadanaki, uh, from uh, Mahinekura, the, she used the term haurangi. It's, it's actually the karanga in the opening of my PhD, ko haurangi tatai. Mm. And I remember saying to her, ko haurangi? <laughs> and there's another part of it, right? But she said, yes, we're intoxicated. Your people are intoxicated by the success of this. Mm. So... You, you know, we, we've been, ten, we've tended to then use haurangi in relation to alcohol, mm. which is a different form of intoxication. Right. So I think, uh, you, you know, there's there are, you know, I mean, you know, I know that in the work you've done with Nakai Chaki and, and, you know, all of us doing our, the old mahi, that there are these kupu that come and you go, yes, that's it. I was online uh, for the Tanaki Reo with Te Ata Rawe the other, uh, other day and he called me a and you know, he used the word puhai um, hai ngā hai and I thought, ngā hai mm. oh my goodness, why had I not thought about that kupu before in terms of trauma, in terms of not jealousy but that impact, you know right. and so we will share some of those kupu that have come up, but uh, it would be lovely to have a context where actually um, we could all share more that are coming from all of our different iwi and our different hapu and our different their journeys and mātanga uh, and, and come to know a little bit mm. more about those kupu. We're touching the tip of the iceberg. We know that for sure. Right. So it's just he, he uh, uh, Honek, uh, has a part I around intersectionality. Um, mm -hmm. Kia ora te koka. Could intersectionality be more appropriately defined as whakapapa in this instance? I mentioned this to Koka Linda as a way of simplifying and unifying this kaupapa as a whole. Aye. Aye, it, um, it is whakapapa. It is whakapapa. Um, 
I mean, it'd be great to have a conversation on you about this. It's uh, because it's also ahuatanga. Te ahuatanga o te tangata. Ke dotu i tanga whakapapa. So where whakapapa provides us with that more holistic, I think, understanding of it, uh, it's also what are the nuanced ways of our ahuatanga. So within our whakapapa, how do we consider our relational way of ensuring the well-being of takatāpui within our whakapapa? Now, I say that because of the context we're in. Because, I, uh, you know, i Hawaii ki rāno, nā 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 wā o nehi, so in the, you know, in the times of our tūpuna, when sexuality wasn't your defining factor, when whakapapa was your defining factor, uh, in my view, uh, that wasn't something we necessarily had to consider in a significant way. But in a context now where we're dealing with a lot of transphobia and homophobia, uh, then we that, so we do have to understand that. So I guess in terms of if we think about within Fokopapa that we uh, ensure the well-being of the uh, Fokopapa katoa, na tangata katoa, then yes, that, that is about ensuring the well-being uh, in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of all those other things. Mm. So it's kind of, it is a complex way of thinking about things. And I, and I definitely think that, you know, oh, more that Whakapapa was the way that we uh, would consider ourselves in terms of relationships. We weren't, we weren't defined prior to colonisation. We weren't defined by gender. We weren't defined uh, by sexuality. We weren't defined in any of those ways. Um, by economics, because our collective well-being was what drove us, and our uh, whakapapa relationships and our whanaungatanga was more critical than who you sleep with. Mm. Mm. Yoni, when I think about whakapapa and intersectionality, I wonder if, you know, when we talk about te tiriti and we say, oh, he tangata tiriti, or they're a great ally. <clears throat> Being an ally doesn't mean somebody speaks for you or takes your space mm. um, and, and for, for in terms of violence and understanding my my experience as a wahine Māori of Taranaki Whakapapa um, is not the same as, as yours as a wahine Māori of Taranaki Whakapapa and the other um, kaupapa and experiences that you kawe so how do we prevent the perpetuation of violence of on our onanga, um by taking what some people might say, um, you know, uh, taking the voice of others or presuming to understand when we may not, we don't understand, we, we cannot understand. As of somebody who has not been in state care, I do not mm. um, speak for the 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 uri who have been um how what is our role to support um but not um to overstep that's a good question um across the board i think it's about if we if we stand uh, in protection of what we stand in affirmation of what we stand in defense of mana or tapu, or whakapapa, uh, then that is for all. So when anyone, so in the state um, abuse cases, and I know Paul has really um, put in a number of comments in Linda's this morning that are so pertinent because as a, someone that is a part of really being at the, she's been at the forefront of challenging with others, you know, the state abuse of our tamariki and mokupuna. And so what does that mean for those of us who have not been in that experience? It means that we support uh, without uh, reservation uh, the morihu that have experienced that, that we support and we affirm and we uplift all of the time the mana and tapu of our whanaunga that have been transgressed in that context, that we challenge, we challenge the state and its inherent racism and its institutional violence uh, on on our people, on our whānau, that we support the calls from Ngā Morihu for the systemic change, for the hapu change, for the return of control and mana motuhaki to whānau hapu and iwi. That, that, that's our role. 
that's our role to do that, uh, just as it's the role, uh, you know, for heterosexual Māori to support takatāpui, to support trans uh, gender whānau who are experiencing huge amount of homophobia and transphobia at the moment at the hands of political parties um, and others, that we speak up, uh, not for anyone, but in support of and in defence of the rights for everyone's mana and tapu to be acknowledged, everyone's papa, everyone's right to papa to be acknowledged, everyone's right to papa and and the mana motuhake and nadanga tiratanga over their papa to be acknowledged, to remove the systems uh, of state abuse, to challenge them. Uh, and, and, you know, to be honest, uh, in the area of state abuse, uh, generally, but specifically in terms of the removal of tamariki from their whakapapa lines uh, and their whānau lines in the way that the state has for many years, uh, that was raised in Pūaltia Atatū many years ago. Uh, I, in my view, uh, as iwi uh, organisations, uh, and I'm talking about at a iwi organisation, a post-settlement group entity level, uh, there are only a small number of iwi that have taken on that challenge on behalf of their own whanaunga at a structural level. Uh, we really have been told very clearly that we need to say to the Crown, that's it. You do not touch one more Māori child. Hands off our tamariki. That's been told very clearly, articulated very clearly uh, uh, by those at the front line of that movement. And so we we have an obligation, I think, to say to our iwi organisations, at what point do you say to the Crown, you do not enter our regions, you do not enter our territories to do that anymore? We have Māori, Kaupapa Māori organisations uh, that are, are working with whānau for the benefit and wellbeing of all whānau members uh, that can make those kind of change, trans, you know, transformative changes that we need to do. Uh, and that's what I mean, the, the existing systems that we're operating in, in the context at the moment uh, still continues to believe it has a validity in the way in which it works. Um, Royal commissions are not seeming to do very much at all uh, for change. And so we need to really start thinking about how do we leverage the influence both economically and within our rohi of iwi to make the kind of changes that our whānau are actually asking for, that our whanaunga are asking to happen. So we can walk alongside each other in many different spaces uh, and make the challenges to structures and institutions in alignment with what particular groups of our people are saying they need, they want, and needs to happen. Thank you. We have a uh, pātai from Joanna Rama Manga. Uh, Ngamahi mahana e hoa, mahi atahua. How do we inform our tangata whenua professional groups that their assertions that they have to take conservative approaches and inform tangata tiriti on mātauranga Māori? Mm. Mm. Ofakaro. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, Kaupapa of Māori uh, initiatives have also always been about rangatiratanga, that is a key principle. And rangatiratanga requires us to do it for ourselves. So when we're talking about mātauranga Māori, that is for us to, de to define, to control, to drive, to lead. Allies, supporters, tangatatiriti, as I in a similar way to how we just talked about our relationship with each other uh, as Māori and, and the various groupings within Te Ao Māori that need to have that alignment and support to walk alongside. It's the same thing in terms of the relationship that we have uh, with Pākehā and with the wider tangata tiriti. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of new term for me. I kind of still grapple with what that term is. Um, our role first and foremost is for Mātauranga Māori to go to Māori, for Tikanga Māori to be re revitalised, regenerated, Te Reo Māori for Māori. That's our first line. And Kaupapa Māori requires us to do that for ourselves. So in terms of working with partners, um, 
in a treaty relationship, they have other jobs that they need to do. They need to challenge racism. They need to challenge institutional oppression. They need to challenge the um, continued crown assertion uh, of, of uh, a notion of sovereignty that was never ceded. Those are the things that Tangata Tiriti need to be doing. They need to ensure that in the spaces where Māori are, are fighting and struggling to have voice, that they are a part of opening that space, if that is what they have the power to do and the influence to do. But they open the space and then they step aside. So um, in many ways, we don't have the resources or the power to be, uh, you know, educating people in Mātauranga Māori. But we do have the need to educate people in their role to create the space for Kaupapa Māori to come through. So one of the things we see at the moment is this increasing uh, level of government agencies uh, saying that that somehow they have a Kaupapa Māori team or they do Kaupapa Māori, well, they don't. They can call it whatever they like, but it's not Kaupapa Māori. And the reason we can say that is that the fundamental principle of Kaupapa Māori is rangatiratanga. Crown and agencies and non-Māori organisations are kāwanatanga. They are not rangatiratanga. Rangatiratanga aligns with us. So there's a kāwanatanga line and a rangatiratanga line. And that's what we see in Te Tiriti o Waitangi. There are roles and obligations that come with that. There are accountability and responsibilities that come with that. We know what ours are. Many of them still haven't worked out what theirs are. And actually the, the strongest relationships come when, when organisations are actually aware of that. So that's not to say that in some organisations we need to be working um, with Pākehā colleagues uh, to make those changes. Why? Because we can see that transforming that organisation is a useful, beneficial thing for our people. Uh, until such time as we have our own. Uh, but it's not um, really where our priority should be. Our priority should be in the healing and well-being of our own. And that means the reconnection of our own uh, into those, into our spaces. Yeah. And you did say, you talked about the, um, you know, uh, colonisation processes, which is... Um, the antithesis of mana and the transit it is the transgression um and, and violation of tapu uh you also mentioned the only that um we live in a people-centric um mm. world or, or system which is a dominant it's a dominant way of thinking and and you mentioned mana is the way that we perceive mana now um how we imagine it is there a gender, you know, dominated definition around mana? What is your definition of mana? Well, I've always tended to to go with one uh, uh, inherent sense of my ku intuition, um, and then you know, as a as a scholar, uh, you know, someone that works in this particular field. You're really investigating how our people and listening to how our people talk about it. So, you know, when we go back to, as I said, people like Rose Pire, Māori Marsden, others, um, when they talk about mana, they talk about mana as being uh, imbued maina tūpuna maina atua. So we're born with mana. There's no gender in mana. Um Mana is an inherent way of being that comes to us through our whakapapa, as I call this, call it up through our whakapapa line. It comes mainga atua, mainga tupuna, kiahai. So what I carry has come through my whakapapa line, and I'm born with it. We are all born with mana. What happens in our lifetime? is how we enhance or diminish that sense in our actions, in our behaviours, in how we are. And so um, when we talk about violence as being a transgression of someone else's mana, that doesn't mean that their mana is diminished. That means that we've transgressed it. 
that we 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 have violated or done damage to to that person and every part of their inherent mana. It doesn't mean that that they have less mana. Mm. In fact, what it means is that probably we're diminishing our own. You know, so um, there is no indication to me uh, outside of white ethnographers who really was their own to their own benefit to diminish the mana of wahine and to gender uh, the way in which we talked about mana and vangatira. Um, there is no evidence that indicates that mana was or has ever been considered to be gendered. Mm. And the mm. term mana wahine uh, that we utilize at the moment is because we need to, in this context, to remind people of the mana of wahine, because it's been so diminished by others, it's been so denied by others, it's been so marginalized by others, um, particularly anthropologists and ethnographers. The damage done by those authors has been significant. And there are times when I hear people say things and it's like reading Alston Best. Um, you know, and I just think, that source is not a good one. <laughs> we should not be sourcing our relationship with each other through a white ethnographer and, and the genealogy of scholars that came after them. Mm. All right. Um, final question here, um, Leonie, is, and I just acknowledge those whose questions we didn't get to um, today. We will share these questions with you and hopefully we may be able to, um, by the power of technology, uh, connect to the kai um, pātai. Uh, but one of your, you, you mentioned that one of the purposes of the research of Hiwaka Ekenua was to look at the impact of policy or, or how might this research impact policy. If these definitions of violence, which goes beyond this intimate partner violence definition, were really taken into account, what would we see in policy? So for example, policy in housing, education, mm. justice, what would what would be inherently different? I think what we would see, and, and Linda's going to talk a bit about this in the she's doing a webinar specifically to the Rangatiratanga component that came up, which was really asserted in the Kaupapa Māori decolonizing component. Um, but if we were taking these definitions, Kaupamari definitions, what we'd say is that uh, in my ideal world is that all of the agencies would go into a tiriti or waitangi uh, resourcing split, that the resources that uh, should be applied and allocated to Kaupamari uh, providers in all of the field would be provided. That would include a 50-50 split of all resources that are currently held in ministries. Uh, they would go into Kaupamari organisations with a Kaupamari um uh, way of approaching everything. And so therefore we would be able to enact some of the things. You know, the, you know, Māori providers are doing this already. I mean, we need to, we need to, you know, well, I, I need to just articulate that and affirm that. Māori providers, iwi providers, Māori organisations, or the wa healers are doing this work irrespective of the denial of it. That is the power of our people. They tell us no, and we do it anyway. They say no to koanga, and we open them in our garages. They say no to kura, and we can we expand the garage. You know, it's like uh, we we are doing this anyway. But if we had a meaningful, tiriti based way of operating within this country, and we know that the majority of resources are going to non kopapa or non Māori organisations, they are meant to be working with our Fano, because the Fano order uh, numbers in terms of the budget tell us that. They tell us very clearly where the money is going, where the resourcing is going. Then that's what would happen. We would see policy shifts that would actually take us into a tiriti or waitangi relationship that would be enabling of all of these kaupapa Māori ways of being to happen. A number of years ago, when my tamariki were in kōhanga, um, and you know, for those of us who were in Kohanga early, we remember these things, right? We would buy the Pākehā books and we would, someone would translate and we'd type it up and we'd glue it on over top of the Pākehā woods <laughs> so that our kids have books. 
right? I've done with a care box because we didn't have any. Uh, and I remember that at that time, uh, writing to the school media group, I've got learning media, I think they were at the time, yes. and suggesting to them that maybe for the next 20 years they only print Māori books. And that wouldn't even catch us up. <laughs> I mean, you know, that kind of suggestion goes down like a cup of cold sick, really. Uh, but that needs to be said. But they need to be said. And someone needs to say them. And sometimes it needs to be people like Linda and I, Cheryl, that are outside of the Māori organisations, because when Māori organisations, sadly, when Māori providers and Māori practitioners and Māori organisations really say what we need, often they get penalised. And so when you're talking about allies, that's the role of the researcher, type of Māori researcher, alongside Māori organisations, is that sometimes we need to say the things that need to be said to support the kaimahi at the, at the coalface um, because then it doesn't come back in negative ways on people who are doing the work. But, yeah, that's what I would say. Give us 20 years of all of the funding and let's see how balanced we get. Mina rawa tu, Leonie. Mm. Ko pau te waki a tāua i tēnei. Um, nui te mihi me o pūkenga o kōrero ko whāriki ki a mātou e ngā kai whakarongo. Uh, and we still have um, so many who have stayed online for this whole 90-minute um, period. Uh, we have one more session today with Cheryl Smith and um, uh, and, and that kōrero uh, will come up on a slide very shortly. Um, but just also acknowledging, Leone, um, your leadership with the Waka Eke Noa um, researchers and also with um, to the funders and the supporters of this mai. So um, join us at 2.30 e Huama. Our next session is on the historical and intergenerational trauma, a genealogy of, um, of violence. And for those of you who we, whose questions we missed um, uh, in this session, we do hope that you'll join us and um, we will post those questions as they as they weave with our kai kōrero, um Dr. Cheryl um, Smith. So, uh, ngā mihi nui kia koutou e whakarongo mai ana, kia whakakapi tō tātou uh, wā uh, i tēnei wā. <coughs> Heki tia ngā taumahatanga, Heki tia ngā taupehitanga, kia rai ko mā, kia tau te mauri, kia oranga tātou, Kia puta, ki te whai ao, ki te ao mārama. Whanu, whanu, haramai te toki, haumi e, hui e, tāiki e. Kia ora no tātou.